I'm Frank Corey. I'm with the Conservation District. And this is... Hi everybody, I'm Joel Inger. I work with Washington Fish and Wildlife. And I think these chairs are here since we stay within the camera. Is that what this is about? That's the barrier. Yeah, All so right. come on in. So maybe I'll go over this side. Oh, all right. Now it's not going to work, is it? Oh, okay. let's do it right here. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about agricultural drainage a little bit. Um, permitting, all that kind of stuff. Um, we haven't given this presentation together before, so we're just kind of kicking it back and forth informally between us. So if we look unprofessional, that's the way we like it. <laughs> um, here's the big question. Do you need a permit to clean your ditch? There is a definite answer to this one, and it is. It all depends. So <laughs> what does it depend on? Um, a number of things. The most important of which is probably water course classification. Um, using Conservation District has been working on this with Department of Fish and Wildlife and other agencies for quite a number of years now. There's different labels you can put on different kinds of water courses. Um, the ones we've been using here in Watson are works. Natural, modified natural, and constructor. Um, natural water courses, you're not really going to find here in lowland Watson County much. They're ones that have never been straightened, that all the riparian vegetation has never been stripped off of it. Um, there's not too many cases like that. Bertrand Creek within Berthus and Park is still a pretty natural water course, I would say. There's a few places like that, maybe. I don't know if there's others that you would point out as being. Um, in the lowland section, you know, it's the, the definition of a natural water course is a, you know, a stream that's been unchanged. Um, so it's got a kind of a natural headwaters that hasn't really been dredged out or channelized or straightened in any way. And yeah, in the lower, um, in the lower county area where there's a lot of agricultural um, and development over the last hundred or so years, um, most of those channels have been modified in some fashion or another. Um, so we don't have a lot of those. Um, and I guess, you know, moving on, we've got the modified natural, which are those systems that um, we consider to have been on the landscape prior to development and have been augmented in some form or fashion um, to allow development of the landscape and also um, usage of that land for agricultural purposes. Um, so those have been straightened um, and or had the riparian areas removed. Um, oftentimes there's you know, water crossings or culverts for um, getting machinery and access across those systems. Um, and those are the main systems that Fish and Wildlife is really worried about or cares about. Um, they are systems that are classified as streams, even though they sometimes look like very straight line ditches. Um, they often have appropriate habitat and hydrology in order to support fish life. And that's where kind of I come in as Fish and Wildlife. And I guess then we have constructed systems. And um, constructed systems are what we find totally just within a farm field. They start within a farm field, and they usually end up in a modified natural water course. But there's no headwaters. There's no um, big wetland complex that they're draining, nothing like that. It's just a ditch that somebody dug in the field to drain that particular field. Uh, to look at this a little different way, um, here's an aerial photo up here on the, this is probably a, some upland here, a hill with some natural water courses coming down, which we've labeled as red, because from a permitting standpoint, stop, you're not going to do too much to those. Um, flows into what we're now calling a modified natural water course. This probably historically, you know, meandered down through the lowland here, and it was straightened you can tell a straight and stream because the meanders turn into 90 degree angles <laughs> each and every time following parcel lines. It's so convenient. And then, so those are yellow. You can do work in them, but be cautioned. You have to slow down, 
think about what you want to do, get your permits in place, all that kind of stuff. And then these are the field ditches, the constructed ones. Um, they start in the field, they end in the field, they end in the modified natural. There's um, nothing natural about them. Those are green, we made them green, which means go, do whatever you want, but it's really not quite that simple because you don't want to do something to this that impacts the yellow modified natural. We're looking at downstream impacts. So natural, modified natural, constructed. There will be a test at the end of this session here, so just three things to remember. Um, I got a question. Yeah. How do you separate the two? For example, uh, your, your, field, your field ditches are intended basically to drain liquid out. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're not great. They're not intended to, to uh, be fish habitat. Right. That's correct. But just the fish can't go in there unless there's a, a, a precautionary type of uh, construction that uh, will uh, prevent them from going up there. Right. And so um, there is in these systems just because a ditch is listed as fully constructed um, doesn't mean that there's not fish there. But under the rules and regulations that are set up by the state of Washington, I, at Fish and Wildlife, have no regulation over 100% artificially constructed channels, which is what we're talking about in green. And up on the screen here, we can see um, one of the local uh, consolidated drainage improvement districts, uh, number 21, which covers the majority of the area just north of here, I think. Yeah. Um, Scott Ditch, Elder Ditch, um, the exit to Fountain Lake are all considered those modified natural drainages. That's the yellow hash mark here, modified natural. And so you can see that, yes, there are, there are substantial sections of modified natural systems out there, but there's also a lot of green, and there's a lot of constructed um, ditch lines or waterways that fall outside of the permitting jurisdiction. And so, um, when we think about, you know, doing work in those areas, there may be fish there, um, but we need to make sure that as we're doing work in the sections that are green, there's not downstream impacts that are affecting the watercourses that are labeled as yellow or modified natural. Um, to follow up on your question just a bit more, yeah, you know, fish could go up here, a little coho fry, Juvenile fish, they go everywhere. If the water quality is decent, they may well go up there. We're not doing anything to encourage them to go up there. But we're also not encouraging anybody to put up a screen or something to prevent them from going up there. And that's from a practical standpoint as much as anything. Fish screens are a royal pain to maintain. You really don't want to do that. Those are put in for drainage. Putting an obstruction in there to that drainage is kind of the last thing you want to do. But um, it sounds good, but it's not really the thing to do. Um, this is all Nooksack River floodplain here. So when the Nooksack floods, this all goes underwater here. Um, the fish, we assume, go with them and end up going through the constructed ditches into Scott Ditch and out to the river. Um, and we wouldn't want to necessarily impede them from getting back in the river where they belong and out of the fields either. Excuse me, when you say you can't impact uh, the yellow by working the green, what are you talking about? Primarily we're talking about sending a big plume of muddy water down into the yellow, uh, sending a bunch of sediment down in there. So if you can do your work in the green when it's dry, if you can put in, we're going to talk about BMPs pretty soon, best management practices. Um, we'll get into that, but a bunch of different ways to minimize that impact to water quality downstream. Um, so you just want to do your work at a time of year and in such a way that you're not sending, you're dredging all this out yesterday during the storm and sending a big muddy plume down here and put it into the next half, which is probably already muddy, but that's a different story. Um, that's what we're hoping you won't do, because that's what's going to impact those fish in the modified natural water, of course. There's not too much else that we're really concerned about in those, in those field ditches. 
Um, so the two classifications, constructed water course, modified natural water course, we're going to ignore natural because it just doesn't come up that much. Constructed water course, there's no pe permit required from Fish and Wildlife. Those are not considered to be waters of the state. Joel and his agency have no jurisdiction there. Whatcom County Planning and Development Services. Uh, Matt Mahaffey is back here from them today if you have any questions for him. Or if you want to chime in, ever Matt, go for it. Um, they require a simple one-page notification of natural resource activity. They ask you that you let them know what you're going to do. I believe there's a $35 fee with that. Right. And they input it into their database. If anybody contacts them and says, hey, farmer A is mucking up their ditch, they can look it up and ensure that person that, yes, they've notified us of that. It's a constructed ditch. They're using the proper techniques, and it's, it's all good. Um, but like we just talked about, and we'll talk more about best management practices to ensure that you're not bucking anything up downstream. Modified natural water courses, permits are required from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, from Whatcom County, sometimes from the Army Corps of Engineers, but we kind of try not to think too hard about that. Um, mitigation is usually required to offset impacts. When you go in there and do anything in a fish bearing stream, you're going to have impacts to fish, to fish habitat. Mm -hmm. Generally, you're required to mitigate for those in some way. And then again, the BMP, we'll try not to use any acronyms, but BMP is one we can't help ourselves use. Um, and so work in modified natural water courses, it can be anything from dredging the whole thing out periodically to going in and dealing with this guy um, pulling out a beaver dam or something. And the BMPs are a little different depending upon what you want to do. Where do intermittent water flow? Where, where it was intermittent flow in the streams. Yeah. Okay. I so was a modified natural water course. Yep. But in the summer, it's more. Right. And so um, you know, here in Washington, we have very long, dry, uh, warm summers, and a lot of the lowland streams are rain-fed streams, and so they're not snow melt. They don't have really big spring sources, and so yes, several of the systems. Um, will dry out in the summer and that's typically the best time to do some of this work um, but just because a system dries out doesn't mean that during the winter there can't be fish that utilize that area um, for part of their life cycle so we need to protect that area and protect some of that habitat to make sure that when the fish are there when there is water in the stream that they have the, the function of that system that they require to live out their life cycle And so, um, talking about permits, um, from the Fish and Wildlife, there is a permit. Um, it's a hydraulic project approval, and shortened acronym, HPA. Um, and oh, explain this one. Another acronym. Sorry, he made this slide, I didn't. <laughs> Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, WDFW um, has the authority to issue permits for um, impacts to waters of the state and also to protect fish life and the habitat that fish require in order to survive. Um, it's actually one of the oldest environmental laws that the state of Washington actually has. It was adopted back in 1943. Uh, and it's gone through several iterations since then and morphed and changed. Uh, and the current rule and the basis of the, the authority is that a permit is required for any work that will use, divert, obstruct or change the natural flow of waters of the state or the bed of any stream channel. And that's codified in Washington Administrative Code 22660. Um, and it, I guess for the agricultural community, um, it, it's gonna identify anything that's in those modified natural streams or in a natural system um, and include anything that from uh, vegetation management along the immediate banks of that stream channel, um, beaver dam or beaver management, um, water crossings, so culverts or bridges that need maintenance or repair or replacement, 
Um, also dredging of a stream channel to encourage flow and also bank stabilization if there's any erosion that's happening along these kind of stream systems. There's a, a variety of other kinds of projects that sometimes pop up, but those are kind of the main ones that we deal with in the agricultural community. And so through the permit process, some of the things that I'll be looking at as you are developing your project is what is the construction process and how are you going to be protecting the water course um, in order to reduce those impacts to downstream waters. Um, and we just need to remember that any work is, that is regulated by Fish and Wildlife is for uh, those modified natural or natural waterways only. I might point out that working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife here in this county is really streamlined. It's Joel. Yep. You call Joel, he's the one that comes out and looks at your site, he's the one that works with you on permitting and everything. It's not this huge bureaucracy where you go to one desk and get sent to another desk or get sent to another desk. It's Joel. With the exception of some Samish River areas where it might be somebody else. But yeah. It's generally Joel and, and that makes it really convenient. And, We've had a lot of Joels here. Joel's the best Joel we, we have so far. <laughs> so yeah, only work in modified uh, natural systems or natural waterways. Um, permitting pathways, which is where we kind of wanted to go is something new in this talk today is the traditional system has been an individual permit for each project. If you want to do drainage maintenance work in your modified natural water course, you go through a permitting process with Fish and Wildlife and with the county for that project. Now we're, we're starting to, to grow into a different, where we're trying to get a general or programmatic permit for some entity, which as landowners, as the entity itself, you can do multiple projects for multiple years under that one permit. Um, the kind of entities we've been working with, we have a number of those in place for drainage improvement districts. Um, we have one of those in place for levy maintenance, vegetation maintenance for the flood control zone district. And we're just moving into the same sort of permitting for some of the new watershed improvement districts. This map, is not the greatest map, but it shows most of the ag lands of Whatcom County and all these colored areas are where one of these special districts exist. So if we can move towards, over a period of months or years, towards each of these entities holding one of these general permits, then we've made a big step forward in, in streamlining this whole process. Um, this is an example of the South Linden Watershed Improvement District, which is um, south of Linden. It's kind of a weird one. It also goes north of Linden a little bit and east of Linden. Um, but what we've done is developed a agricultural and watershed enhancement plan for the South Linden Watershed Improvement District, which includes um, all the best management practices, which we'll get to later. Um, the water course classifications very specifically for that district. So if you live in that district, we can provide you with a map all color coded, red, yellow, and green. So you can look at your property and know with certainty whether you need to talk to Joel or not. <laughs> and that's, that's a pretty big benefit. Um, the South Linden Wood has an elected board of commissioners, are they called, Henry? Or? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Um, you can call them, or you can call Henry, or you can call me, and we can make that map available. Um, so it will take a little time, but we're hoping to develop that district by district through the county. Are there, are there any weirs in those? Any weirs? Yeah. W-E-I-R-S. I-R-S. In order to... Well, the reason I raise that as a question mm -hmm. is, you know, if you want to cultivate uh, habitat, mm -hmm. you need to have weirs. But the state does not, the state expects the individual to maintain the weirs, and they don't, they're not involved in the uh, actual, very, over very limited amount of putting weirs within the natural process to the tributary, which is, is in the interest of the habitat. Well, so 
I guess weirs are you know boards that are across the stream to backwater a certain section. Is that what you're talking well, you, about? Don't you want to manage your water though so that you have more even flow and, uh, and you also have a, a better spot for fish uh, to habitat during the, the shorter periods of water flow. Right, and so um, you know weirs are something that can be used. Um, we don't use them very often. There's um, there's a weir or a dam at the outlet of Weiser Lake, um, and we are kind of moving away from weirs in order to backwater sections because sometimes they are actually create a water surface drop. So you have a weir or a board across, and it creates a, a small waterfall, which that can actually prevent movement of fish upstream and downstream through that section. Um, and so we're we're really moving away from weirs or fish ladders or something to that effect. Um, most of the streams that we have within the lower section of, of the county are, you know, these modified natural water courses in there. They're fairly deep, they're fairly in size, which means that they're kind of dug down into the fields. Um, and for the most part, you know, during the times of the year when we have um, fish migrating up and into those systems, there's plenty of water. Um, we do have times of the year where in those systems, things start to dry out, and that is um, that's a natural kind of a natural process of what streams do within uh, the Whatcom County area during some of those long, dry, hot summers. And so, during the winter, we have a, a lot of habitat, and as things slowly drain and dry out, then it does it, it kind of drops down. But as the water goes down, the fish can kind of sense that, and they kind of move downstream with that water, and so they're going to be moving throughout the water courses to find wherever the appropriate water is. Okay. Um, so within these management plans, so the best way to do these general permits is to have a pretty specific management plan for that district. It's have water course classifications, and it has sort of the work that they want to do over a period of years, and that's going to flex some as, as new projects come up. You don't want to, um, so we've sort of divided that into habitat or watershed enhancement projects, like replacing a culvert that's a barrier to fish passage. Oftentimes, that's also a drainage benefit that tends to be a win-win. Um, riparian planting, all kinds of other stuff. Um, sometimes these projects can be mitigation for agricultural enhancements, mm -hmm. such as drainage maintenance, adding a stream crossing for field access, um, and a whole bunch of other things. And so these kind of things, usually have a short-term or long-term negative impact to fish or fish habitat, so mitigation is required, and the acronym one more time, which we'll, we'll get to. Um, the management plan is the advantage of it. Water course classification is a huge advantage to the district and to its landowners. Um, time savings for permitting agencies. We only have one Joel, if he can do 12 projects a year under one permit rather than 12 individual permits and he has more time to go out and work with landowners and, and be of assistance to the community here. Um, cost savings for landowners, the special district, the South Linden Wood in this case has already paid those permitting fees. Um, sometimes there's a, a small fee like with the notification of activity of the $35 that the landowner would pay, but generally that's all taken care of. And once again, the BMPs would be clearly stated in that permit, so you know what you need to do going into it. Frank? Yep. Interrupt. Uh, we have waived the fees at the party. So we need to Cheaper yet. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. And do electronic submittals. So that makes it easy. Yep. Yeah. Super. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, the story is that we're really trying to make it easier through the, the paperwork process to be able to get out there and actually conduct some of the work. Um, it's still, the work still has to meet the standards, but it's going to save, save money, save a lot of time, um, because it just takes time to process some of those things um, as far as different projects go. And under the permit, we can submit those different projects and do it a little bit more informally because all the legwork has already been done. So there is some really, really big advantages of the drainage improvement districts and also the uh, watershed improvement districts to getting on board with some of these generalized permits.
Can you guys explain what's going on in those two photos? Uh, this is sort of the BMP thing, which we'll get to in more detail here in a minute. But this was a dredging project, or a cleaning project, as we like to call them now. Um, they hooked up a pump upstream from the project, built a sandbag dam to divert clean water around it. So you've got this nice clean water going back into the stream below the project. This is one, I don't know how good this picture is from back there where that wasn't done. And this is like the muddiest water I've ever seen in my life. This is a little bit of a silt fence here to try to trap it. It ain't working. So uh, <laughs> that's, be it a field ditch or whatever, this is what we don't want. This is what is going to be impacting the critters that live in the water yeah. pretty severely. Um, so the concerns we have now that we've got a few of these long-term permits in place are that it, it takes a lot of really good coordination from the special district commissioners or somebody to do the notifications to the agencies that a project is coming up, whether the landowner is doing it themselves or whether the special district is. Notifications, communication, making sure the permit is being followed, who's managing the project, who's providing oversight, and are the BMPs being implemented in the way that, in this case, the South Linden would agree to when they applied for the permits. Um, it, we hope it doesn't add another level of bureaucracy that you're having to deal with your elected commissioners as well as the agencies, and that hasn't really been the case yet. But th those are the, the concerns we have, and, and moving forward, we need to make sure that all these things are done well so that these agencies will keep issuing these permits. Here we go, finally, BMPs, my favorite thing. We have developed, this was a few years ago, but we went through a process where we developed fact sheets, and we have a few of these sitting over here, on how to do things without having, with having minimal impacts to, it's mostly fish and fish habitat that we're talking about. So water quality protection measures, again, the pumping around, the silt fences, things like that. Fish protection, what you need to do to make sure you're not killing fish when you're in there cleaning the channel. Um, constructed water course, if you're just working in the field ditch, just some things to keep in mind so you're not impacting things downstream. These are the sort of things that are attached to that general permit. So if you're implementing a project, working with your special district under their permit, they would theoretically be providing you with these, and you would be following them to the best of your ability, and Joel would be following up and making sure you're doing that to the best of your ability. And these, are, these fact sheets are a really great resource for the local community here, or, or anywhere, in order to conduct some of this type of work. Um, the, the fact sheets that were developed really took a lot of the rules and regulations out of state law, out of the local county law, and really simplified them down so that they're easily understood and um, can be implemented by someone with maybe not great stream knowledge. Um, and it, they're, they're really great. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're looking to do a project, definitely um, find those. I think they're on the, the Conservation District's website, um, and they're associated with some of the permits that I've written. So. We have lots of hard copies over there. Katie and I can set you up with those if you ever need one. Um, so the acronym BMP, which we use just off the top of our head, Best Management Practices. I spoke at a workshop in Canada a couple years ago, and they accused me of being an egotistical American by using the word best. They use beneficial management practices, <laughs> saying that it's better, but it's not necessarily best. And I kind of appreciate that, actually, those crazy Canadians. So the three things that are really focused on BMPs are timing. There's a fish window. When if the stream is not intermittent, it's not dry, that you can get in there and do work and have the, the least impact. And that fish window typically is? Uh, for this area, it's typically middle of July until the end of September. And it's kind of that, that portion of the year um, because that is when the fish are in um, a life cycle that is less disrupted by your activities. Um, there's not spawning going on so that we don't have eggs or nests um, down into the gravels or in the sediments. 
Um, all the fish are going to be free swimming, um, typically in a juvenile form, so they're going to be a couple inches long, um, and they're easily going to be able to be caught and moved out of the area. Um, and so that's kind of why we have the fish window. And moving on, we, that's fish uh, protection. Fish protection. And Even though you're in the fish window, there's still going to be fish there if there's water there. Very true. Um, we have a lot of fish, um, salmon, and local resident species that live and um, reside in the local um, agricultural ditches that are listed as those modified natural systems. Um, and some of the protections that we need is to be able to remove those fish from the work area. Whatever you're doing, whether it's a dredge project or it is a culvert replacement type of a project, anything where we're having um, excavation into the stream channel is really where we're going to focus on um, trying to protect those fish and get them out of that, that work area. And that can be done by netting, um, by sweeping down through the work area, um, also by electrofishing. It's this gentleman up here. And the photo has an electrofisher. Um, it shocks the water, and then the fish will rise up to the top. It stuns them, but it doesn't kill them, and then they can get scooped up and moved on to a, a, an area where the work is not going to be completed. Um, and also putting up lock nets upstream and downstream to prevent that migration of fish into the work area. So it's really dividing and isolating that work area. So the other impact that can happen to fish is water quality. What we keep saying is, we don't, you know, you have a huge impact to fish if you send a bunch of muddy water downstream. Um, you've excluded the fish from where you're working, so you can have muddy water there, but you don't want to let it go. Um, and there's a number of ways to deal with that, and Joel's going to show you a diagram here in a minute, I think. Yes. Yeah, and so here we go with a project isolation. This is just, a, it's actually a diagram from one of the DMP uh, fact sheets. Um, that the conservation put out, and you can see that um, we have a work area here where we're isolating. Um, that can be your section of dredging that you're doing or a culvert replacement. Um, and basically, you're going to set up a dam across the stream channel and block all the flow from going down through that area. We also want to put a dam at the downstream um, so that we don't have water backing up into the area. And we're going to pump that flow up and around the, uh, the project area so that we're not creating that dirty water and we're not um, impacting fish downstream. And so this is a pretty good diagram, but it, it was kind of, it's kind of leaving a couple things out. And so at the downstream end, we had a picture earlier of the energy dissipation where the water was spraying out onto a, onto a sheet of plastic. Um, there's a variety of different methods that can be done there, but as we're forcing the water through the pump, sometimes the, the force of that water can um, impact the banks or create scour and actually create some muddy water, which is then going to be moved downstream. So we want to prevent that. You know, next is in our isolation area. Sometimes there's additional water that will come in, and it's, it's kind of hard to manage that. And so if you're scooping in there and making a lot of dirty water, sometimes we have to manage that dirty water by adding another pump and pumping that dirty water out into a field or out into uh, a separate, one of those constructed um, drainage ditches actually works really well. Pump that way upfield and allow it to drain out slowly through the vegetation and it will help absorb a lot of that, that sediment and dirty water as it moves back down towards the modified natural systems. And if we're working in a system that has fish, we're going to need to put up some, some extra protections. We're going to put that block net upstream which is a picture of a block net that um, is put up so we don't have migration in and around those areas that's doing construction. And then also doing fish uh, exclusion or salvage um, from the isolation area. And that's the next one. And there you go, a guy with a bucket and a, and a dip net going out there to find those fish and, and pull those out of the isolated work area. Now we're going to look at some projects that were done this summer. Um, this is a project that Drainage Improvement District number five did. Um, this is kind of interesting in a few seconds here. This is all peak ground, and you'll see the excavator bouncing around on the ground here. It's really challenging. There you go. It's real, yeah. This is off Hannigan Road. If you're standing out there in the field and a semi truck goes down and down Hannigan Road, you feel the whole field moving. It's pretty remarkable. 
So trying to maintain a ditch channel in it definitely requires maintenance occasionally because it's going to try to close down. Um, this is a project on what was determined to be a constructed ditch. So there were, the only permit required was a notification of activity to Whatcom County, which I filled out with a map and the BMP is attached. I emailed it to map. Ten days later, we had a letter of authorization to do the work. It was, that's the way the system was supposed to work, and it worked. <laughs> it was awesome. Um, we consulted with Joel here to determine it was a district we hadn't totally mapped. So was it a modified natural? Was it a constructed? We determined that this reach of the stream was a constructed, uh, which made things a lot easier. This is what it looked like prior to maintenance. It hadn't been maintained for years and years and years, I don't think. Um, the operator, Jimmy Z, if anybody knows Jimmy Z, um, pretty good operator. He peeled down one side to where he could scoop it out pretty cleanly, um, trying to not leave a whole bunch of loose stuff in the bottom of the ditch that would turn to mud, which would slow downstream eventually. Um, construct the ditch, it flows downstream in a modified natural stream which of course are all full of fish and kids fishing and everything. We didn't want to send a big muddy plume of water there. They came up with a little bit of a plan, how to prevent that. There was a little bit of water in the ditch and as they, they worked, they generated a little bit more flow. Um, so they left a number of dams in place as they did the work to back up that water and not leave this muddy flow going out, which is great. Well, that's for fish. This is a uh, picture. This is a constructed channel, so this is no well, fish. Uh, I got another question. What are the fish going to eat after you get it this clean? <laughs> well, there's not going to. This is a channel that doesn't have fish. This is strictly for drainage. This is strictly, strictly a drainage, drainage channel. Drainage. Yeah, you're not going to have fish there. Or they, That's correct. They're not going to eat. That's right. Okay. The um, I'll show you a picture of the completed project in a minute and comment on that more. So these are the dams they left in place to back up a little bit of water behind it, that which when they were done, they could slowly release that water and let it infiltrate and not have any off-site impacts. Um, the spoils piles were placed well back from the ditch edge and then eventually spread out and seeded. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the spoils piled right along the ditch edge so as not to impact the field, which makes sense. But then they sit there all winter and by the spring, half of the soil is back in the ditch again. That, didn't do anybody any good. Go here, here's the final result, which is great from an agricultural drainage standpoint. Like you were saying, from a fish habitat standpoint, even when there was grass there, it gave the fish cover from predators. It gave them a way to get out of the flow. If this was flowing now and fish were in it, they'd be swimming the whole time. It'd be like standing in the middle of a field with the wind blowing. There's definitely impacts to fish habitat when you do anything like this. And that's why when we're doing this type of work in a system that um, does have fish or is one of those modified natural type systems, uh, there's going to be that mitigation associated with it. We need, so we're going to be impacting um, the, the fish habitat in order to allow better drainage of the surrounding area. And we need to give back and kind of give something back to the fish in order to able to help them survive within the system. So now we're, Brad Raider just walked in, this is perfect. <laughs> oh. Stay out there, Brad. <laughs> the North Linden Watershed Improvement District is a district that I'm working with and Joel is working with right now to generate this, this larger programmatic permit. But they've been doing some work on individual permits the last couple of years. Brad Raider is a commissioner on that district and Henry Beerling provides some assistance to them. So if you guys can just talk a little bit about what you've been doing and how things have been going up there. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so this, uh, I don't, it was hard to have a map of what the North London Wind is like, but this is a piece of our property just uh, on the Fish Trap Creek. And you can see the plantings here that um, was mitigation for ditch cleaning, not, not this, this was just a couple weeks ago that we had some other stuff. Uh, this is uh, Bender Road, but you know Joel's been really good to work with us on figuring out how we got to do this, or how we're going to do this. So what we did here is over the winter of um, 16, so last winter, 
we did the blackberry uh, removal work and then this spring these were planted uh, partnership between Lennon Christian Schools and, and Harlan Credit, who most of you probably know, and um, Daryl Gray and C. And C had provided the plants and some of the supervision, and um, uh, Harlan supplied the labor and the bus to get everybody out there. So uh, we planted, um, I want to say it was 2,700 feet or something. I could be a little, I'm a little off. But the, the mitigation was for ditch cleaning we had done that fall. And we wrote it up and then Joel gave us the ability to get that ditch cleaning done in the proper window. And we did some on Osink and Bender and, and it's, it's working well. Um, what we've seen, and you know, there's a lot of different, a lot of different advantages here, you know, we're gonna, we got some work to keep the blackberries out, which we all know how much fun that is. Over the next few years, we'll make sure that happens. Um, the next piece is the south piece here that we've um, we've uh, met with the Herringa family, and I know Joel likes these south south side things a lot better than the or I guess west facing or south and west facing south and west facing a lot more. He likes this, but he likes that more. So we're working on that project, and um, we ended up we ended up having more f footage on the Herringa property than we need needed for the mitigation and the cleaning that's happening here. So some of that was banked. So we have a reserve that we're just going to keep on a spreadsheet, and I think it'll end up in in this five-year deal that what Frank's talking about. And then we're going to continue to figure out. So that's actually, I just got to note that those blackberries are going to be removed next Wednesday. And that money is coming as project money from the Northland and WID. We're paying for that. And that'll be done, uh, planted next spring by NC and Lenny Christian. And, you know, I don't think Harlan Credit Credit's going to, you know, supply labor out into the depths of the Sumas WID. But as long as it's a pretty short drive from the school, we can make that happen. So we're definitely saving some money. There's no bill from Linda Christian and, and no bill from um, NC. So, uh, you know, getting ditches clean uh, is, is really important for the, for the farmers and to keep drain tiles unplugged. And, um, and then getting planting is, is, is good for the fish. Blackberries are a pain for everybody. So if we can get those out and get some nice cedars in there, and other items, it's just better. Um, Brad, can I make a comment about some of the ditch cleaning that's been going on up there? Yeah. You've been, it's been getting too close to the road prism, and we've got one area up there now that the uh, side of the road is actually caving in, and we're gonna have major road costs. I'm surprised that the county hasn't been thinking about it. Well, I, I'm not sure exactly where you're referring to, but I think it's uh, what we're seeing, you know, that we haven't had a lot of this action going on for a while. And it's, it's, it's extremely important for, you know, agriculture and also homeowners and everybody well, what else. I, what so. I'm saying is that there's a need for a little bit more attention paid to the impact on the transportation system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we can talk to the to the county about that, um, but you know we're we're just excited about how this has been going, and um, you know it's just it's nice to see water moving now, um, and it's nice to see these plantings. And Joel's been really good to work with. To that point, the county is doing the work. Yep. The county, that's county. Uh, you know they, they are. They're, they're, they're maintaining the roads, the roadside ditches. The North Linden with. Yeah, this is that's a county. County, county is, truck. That's a county truck, county organization. So they're well aware of what they're doing. I was wondering they, about that because I'm seeing swimming. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure they'd appreciate knowing those sites. Mm -hmm. They can come out and shore those up. But doing it yeah, before it causes a problem would be the time to do it. Well, and this was, I, I think the, the reason I, oh, sorry, let me just finish the point up before I forget. But I, 
Henry and I sent this email out from the Northland WID because I think it's important for everybody to know that this takes a little bit of work to kind of organize this. It doesn't, the county just didn't say, hey, what, what do you want us to clean tomorrow? Uh, so it does take some work. We, we, we invite Joel to meetings and Frank and we kind of, we, we talk about it. I know there's other conversations like that going on, but I just kind of wanted the landowners out there to know that support your Northland with because we are able to do projects like this having that board and um, so you know and then hopefully everybody got the email that we sent out to them. So what, what is the width that you've got? Well we're trying we, we want to <coughs> be able to take care of that fish trap creek area but we also want to be able to farm too and I, I want to say this is uh, 15, 15 to 20 feet, you know, it's, it's in that area. You can see these old alder trees here that have survived the weather over the years and the beaver, uh, but they're, they're in pretty rough shape, so we'll have cedars growing up there in no time. But we, you know, it's just right on the, on the edge of the, of the creek. It's not a ditch, creek, I guess. Flowing like crazy today, I'll tell you. <laughs> So um, we're also lucky to have Brad as a commissioner on the, on the Sumas Watershed Improvement District, and they've done some projects this summer. They're also working with us towards getting a general permit in place so that each project they do in the future can be done under that one permit. And maybe Brad can speak to what you guys are doing there. Yeah, so my family has land in the Sumas area too, so I've been involved in the Sumas with, and um, this is the Pangborn Creek outflow these uh, two locations had uh, three foot culverts in them prior and uh, based on some meetings we had, I mean, we, I've, we've gotten to know Joel pretty well and his counterpart Melissa over the last couple of years and it's been a really, really nice working relationship because those conversations have led to, um, to projects like this. So we had a major restriction in here, fish bearing, uh, well, fish couldn't get through, fish pa bar fast passage barrier, sorry. Barrier. And um, so this, this is, uh, this Strumler gravel helped us with the cost of, the, these are old county um, bridges. And, and obviously you can see we've got whatever, 15 feet now flowing through that area. And it's probably gonna take another I think we have four more culverts and a couple pretty good sized ones. It'll take another three or four years, but I, we've just kind of decided to focus on that little area and, and get it done. And it, you know, if we can keep this momentum up and not run out of pretty cheap bridge decks, we'll have a, a different looking area pretty soon. But this was, um, it was backing up in farm ground in the Pangborn Creek area, not flowing very well in that Pangborn Lake. And, you know, this, we were, we, this water, I think all of this water flows into Canada, so um, uh, it's it's you know and it does have um, fish downstream and it's a, it's a really nice area. And, um, we have more work to do, but this was pretty exciting to get this done. And it it went right down to the wire. Thanks for I know Joel had to spend some late nights and figuring this stuff out and Daryl Gray and um, I think. You even fielded some emails on this. I know Henry did, but we've done. We've tried to in the Sumas Wood. We've been trying to do more outreach and little field trips. I don't like sitting in the office. I know Henry doesn't like sitting in there very much either. So we've gone out and done some field trips. Uh, met uh, Joel out there a couple times, and we've also done some meetings out at, in Sumas at like Bob's with the with the farmers out there and talking to them. So got some good things going on. Any questions? Anything you want to add, Henry, to the WIDs before we leave that? Uh, I guess I would just say that, you know, this is, I think over the years, one of the most frustrating things that farmers have ever voiced is always about where, knowing where to drain and how they could do anything. Um, people get more frustrated about that than anything else. And um, I just really see some real hope here. For one, an approach, a dialogue with fisheries that actually is productive because we haven't always had that, as you alluded to. 
Um, we got conservation district with a team of people supporting a lot of these things. The WIDS are not interested in putting on new people and doing a lot more work and that kind of guy. We use the conservation district, people like Frank and Chris and all the rest of the team over here for education. Uh, it really is starting to develop. Now the potential is really there. Now it takes people like Brad, one of our commissioners, who actually, at least at one point, had some time to work on this, um, to just come up with some ideas and try to try them out and see them make them work. Because I think everything you proposed, and you haven't always got everything done in the timing that you'd like to see it done, but you've got it done, and you're on the road to getting it done. So I'm just going to encourage all of our WIT commissioners and the people that live within the WITs to press their commissioners to do that. I agree. Thanks, guys. So the last thing we have today is Probably the biggest drainage project that happened in the county this year was in Four Mile Creek, Drainage Improvement District Number 3. And we have Lauren Vanderyot here from Commissioner of that district. Um, he was able to supply us a little video of what the, the site was after drainage. We'll, we'll show you that and he'll talk to you a little bit about that project if you're willing. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, that's the hand again you see up in the left hand corner. So th this is uh, just south of the Beard Road, going west. Uh, be the south end of Roger Block's uh, property, you can see the blueberry field here, and that's a crack project to the south of it. Um, we have a really flat reach going through peak ground, um, and it, it tends to, um, when we start getting sediment in the, in the bottom, it, it backs up a long ways. Um, it had been 12, 15 years since we've done this Just over 15 reach. years. Just over 15. So what had happened, um, this whole north side of this had been planted uh, with a lot of willows. And through the peat, what, what we found out was the roots of the willows, um, it, the bank had reed canary grass in it prior to the last cleaning, and then it was planted with willows. The willow roots, um, the, the reed canary grass helped with erosion from the bank slough the willow roots encouraged uh, erosion and, and sloughing of the peat down into the channel. So that's why you see that we've completely stripped the vegetation on the north side of this is to get rid of those willows. This is our mitigation um, plan. We're going to revegetate that and replant that, but with non, no willows. So now we have to treat, once uh, we start getting some growth of the willows, we have to treat those, kill those, um, so that we can revegetate it with uh, something besides willows. That's still being worked out with NC um, and, and who's going to do the plantings for us. Um, worked with, without Frank and Joel, uh, with our permitting, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, I think we're still towards the end of our five-year permit, or did we start a new Just one? Just started. Just started a new one, yep. okay. Yep. So, um, yeah, like I said, without them, this wouldn't have happened. Um, we went in with an excavator with a mower head on it to mow a lot of the vegetation um, and then stripped it out with excavator. Uh, went in and did the dredging with excavator and you can see we've um, spread the spoils, the, the old peat. Uh, I want to say our total length was about 3,500 feet is what we did this year. Um, did the pumping around, the, the, uh, the, the check dams, the, the, uh, the sediment filtration, um, had a little hiccup one day, I think we had some rain the night before and water came up and took out one of our silt dams and rolled it over and they didn't no notice that right away and Joel noticed it for us and let us know, so <laughs> corrected a couple things and, and uh, went on again. So I would encourage in, in cleaning that to check those BMPs probably before every shift just as a as, as a double check, you know, we were in the low water and in uh, the fish window and there wasn't much water but uh, we got a little bit of rain one night and it, it came up quick and put, rolled one of our silt fences over. So uh, I guess I'd say that Four Mile Creek through that ground there is so flat and the peat soil is such that these BMPs again that we were talking about, hardest place ever to try to do that. A ton of water, it's there, you can't, it was a very challenging project. Um, yeah. The commissioners were good, working with Joel, trying to make adaptive management things, making it as best they could. They got the project done, it needed to be done. They, like Lauren said, they received this five-year general permit, I think just last spring, 
and they have a multi-year plan to go through and, and maintain the yellow water courses in, in their district um, to provide some relief to the landowners. Yeah. It's been 15 years, so if you got to do that every 15 years, that's all right. And it, and it, it allowed us to, you know, obviously the willows were, were not working, so it allowed us to correct that problem. Could you yeah. talk a little bit more about that? Um, the reason I'm asking is I'm with King County, and that's been one of the things that's been proposed because of the height. Um, and I'm just wondering what your experience was. I don't know if they would have been better in a, in a, in a different type of soil, but with the peat, you're fighting the sloughing and the erosion anyway. And so it's, as the roots expand, they're just pushing the, yeah, the just substrate? Yeah, pushing the it right out into the, into the bank. So. Yeah, I think the issue with the willows is that the roots will actually grow out into the channel. Right. Um, and create pathways for that water to get into the banks and kind of slough some of that material off. And also, they'll grow down low across the channel. And so when they grow, they really expand out over the channel. So when you have higher water, it interacts with the, with the flow of water and can really slow things down. Did you guys take pictures at all of the tree treatment condition? We did not, and I, and I wish we had. Yeah. I probably have some. I probably have some. Yeah. And, and downstream, uh, where we stopped, you, it's it still <laughs> looks like an upstream too. Yeah, and, and I want to point out that this was last dredged in the early 2000s, like 1999 through 2003, I think, in phases. And at that point, there wasn't any native vegetation along the stream, so it was all reed canary grass. You could virtually walk across it in places because it was just a big flow of reed canary grass. And, and the idea of planting the riparian stuff along there was to keep that from happening again. Because that grass just comes back in a couple of years, and you're right back to where you were before. Um, we planted a bunch of, I wasn't totally involved at the time, but we, a bunch of different native things were planted. Most of them worked out well. In the peat soil, the willows did not work out so well in that sense. but. They were maybe better than the reef canary grass because we got 15 years before anything had to be done. And if it was open to the reef canary grass, we wouldn't have gotten 15 years. We would have had this going on five or 10 years ago. Even. So we learned a lot. We're not going to replant it with willows. <laughs> We've got some other species that are even better. I sound like a car salesman, but we've, we've got this down now. We know what to do. We have planted willows in other places with more alluvial soil, sandy soils, gravelly soils, and they haven't caused any problem at all. So it's pretty site specific. In Four Mile, they were definitely part of the problem. In that peat ground, though, a lot of sediment getting into the channel, very little flow. That was going to build up with or without the willow inflows. Um, a bunch of the dairy land had been converted to berries in the last 10 years. As you do that conversion, a lot of sediment ended up in the channel. Mm -hmm. It's not going to transport down, it's going to build up. And yeah. Combination of factors there for sure. We have a very flat reach. We're, um, I want to say, from Noon Road to the guide on that four mile creek, I think we have less than 10 feet of slope, 10 feet of fall. So, with that peat ground, um, it just gets in there to sediment and it backs up. And you know, we we're backing water up into blueberries upstream. And uh, we even had several years ago kids that would go up in the summertime underneath the Hannigan Bridge. and. They would put rocks in the channel to back up water to swim, and we'd notice it because we're getting flooded up upstream. So um, you ever the will is just doing that. No, <laughs> no. the will is just compounded the the problem. I'm curious who does the deep fishing around here. Like those electric shock packs are not average equipment. Is it a special contractor or does WFW do that or? So Fish and Wildlife does have uh, some people that can come out and do it. Um, we don't have a lot of those people around, um, so it has to be a project specific, project specific request. Um, but there are local contractors who are fish exclusion, who are uh, resource specialists um, that are out there. Um, and we did we did do some dipping and. Um, we had a toad out there, I guess, that they were mm -hmm. moving some fish and they were finding some cutthroat. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some small cutthroat. I think the biggest ones were six, seven inches, I think they said. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was some fish, whereas. I heard they time, were 36 inches. <laughs> well, it's fish story. <laughs> I don't know. So were you guys dewatering that channel? They were uh, pumping. Uh, did we have one pump or two pumps going? I wasn't out there when much I wasn't the out there either. So, um, so there's a little bit of confusion uh, on the start of the project. 
and I kind of went out and got everybody lined out and got everyone straightened up. Um, but we, there was a pump around and also a pump for the dirty water within the excavation area. And they basically were taking, so it was a two pump system, similar to what I showed up there, um, and they were taking that second pump and pumping it way up into a, a dry field ditch. And because we had such a long, dry, hot summer, all of that water just absorbed into the surrounding area. And I don't think that uh, over the four days that the project was running, that they ever had a connection of that dirty water connecting back to the main center. Any more questions? Any more questions in general? Otherwise, I'll hand it back to Katie. On the overall play? Pardon me? On the overall play? Yeah. You know, it seems to me, I, I watched a program the other night on TV, and it was a guy came from uh, Europe. He was a from Holland. And of course, Holland has major water problems and drinking problems. And he was speaking about the need for uh, having good water planning, like park planning, where you've got the whole the whole area planned. And uh, this gets into, uh, of course, the, the things we see in the floods. Like, you know, up the other day, uh, I was up at uh, last night when it rained, uh, and uh, there where the food pavilion is, that area is all uh, asphalt. And I was thinking to myself, you know, this guy's got a real point. And as our, our communities grow, we need to have a, some type of, I think, process that could be between the different water districts, that there could be a consolidation and also some regulatory activity that could be agreed on by the county. Uh, it would seem to me to be, a, I think, a more constructive thing down the line for the whole the interest of the county, period, including the habitat and fisheries. Sure. Yeah, and I think that's, and Henry's about to chime in about yeah. the watershed improvement yeah. districts. That's right, that's that is the important. purpose behind the whole width, is yeah. that there's yeah. a lot of, you know, yeah. habitat and drainage is one of them, but so are the water supply, having enough water yeah, rights. Exactly. And exactly. all those kind of, and sometimes what we do in one hurts the other, and the idea there is to try to coordinate these things in a way so that we're going to help on all, all, all counts. Yeah. For water quality, habitat, Water supply and stream flows. And, and we have to deal with the urban areas too, which are right. major issues. Uh, right. right. Uh, as they've exploited that uh, Lake Watka and the Duxac River. Right. Did I say Duxac River? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We got another question over here. As far as the urban areas, the Department of Ecology Stormwater Manual for Development well, and I have major criticisms of the way the law is written. I, I think that it's wrong that you have industrial provisions and uh, urban provisions and the individual farmer gets stuck with the little criticisms that they get away with like for example the growth management act you go up to bellingham there and you go down whatcom creek you notice they they don't do the setbacks if they don't want to it, it, the whole thing is they say well it looks nicer but you know that's that's the, that's not the point the point is You've got to slice the bread the same for the urban as well as for the rural. And this is where I see water planning getting involved in this with some regulatory uh, authority based upon the water districts and these, you know, urban areas can they can deal with it. But we have a voice now. Mm -hmm. Including the tribes, yeah. Oh, another question, Darrell. We got a bunch of different entities here, so maybe I'll pose this question, see if there's anybody that can help. <clears throat> who, who regulates the DOT dumping water on our ground? Many years ago, they made some changes on our area, widened the roads, this is a bunch of years ago. Filled our ditches, so we have, and they're piping the water right out into our ditch, or into our fields. So then Ecology comes along and says, your cows are standing in all this running water. You can't do that. So where do we go to have the DOT? Because they're not responsive. Twelve years ago, I really made a campaign trying to get something done, and it went nowhere. I'll give so that what, one to you. <laughs> uh, that is a good question. Um, you know, if DOT is out there and they're doing something within one of these jurisdictional waterways, which is under my control, then they do have to have a permit for us in order to do some of that work. 
And they're not really going to be moving water from one place to another. They're just going to maintain those water courses. And so I would guess that the work that they did was they were lobbying around some of those constructed roadside ditches and maybe were not as attentive to where the water was going to go, except for not on that road. Um, as far as who, who would regulate that? Yeah, in this situation, it happened some time ago, so yeah, it's, it's a matter of working with your current Department of Transportation people. But, so I've, but I've run across this before, especially on the Sonoma County. Essentially, what happens over time, kind of like an under possession kind of thing, they call it a prescriptive easement. It's been long enough that they essentially assume that they now have an easement to disperse the water as a pathway. Really, it's Especially when you know, we've had the property for over 100 years and now they're telling us we can't have our cows and we've had them for 100 years in the same areas. And yet, DOT can say, well, we've been here 30 years, but we don't have to. I can't, I'm actually working with the landowner here in the right now, which kind of same situation, except for the Walton County Public Works that did it 30 years ago. They're having to put in a new marine park for us to connect back to the water way of drain. They're going to find themselves with solid patch of the 